A thank you, thanks of um, Sam. Right, so I'm uh, up front. I should say I'm acutely aware that I'm between you and lunch, um, and uh, I insist that uh, Terry puts me on before Betty next time. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'm going to speak in, in very general terms about progress towards um, characterizing the genome of um, my favorite animal, the coral Acropora millipora, um, and hopefully convince you that, that we're at the beginning at the moment of um, beginning to you, uh, a beginning of a phase in coral biology, which I think is is um, um, going to yield some fundamental insights into biological processes such as calcification. All right, so I want to acknowledge up front our funding sources because um, I may forget to do so later. We're ARC supported, of course, largely, but recently the genome sequencing has been supported by the Australian Genome Research Facility and Illumina uh, Asia Pacific. Um, I think maybe it's the circles I move in, but I think um, recently we're, we're in a very exciting phase of, of coral biology, I think, because there's an increasing realization that, that understanding um, many aspects of coral biology requires that you know a lot more about the nuts and bolts, about the basic underlying molecular framework. I think it's also fair to say that there's now a... Um, an increasing realization in the coral biology community of the power of model systems, um, of the power of actually getting to know one organism really well, one or a few organisms really well. And I'm, I'm uh, grateful for um, the, the uh, chance that our model organism, my favorite um, animal, um, has become one of the, the lab rats of um, coral biology. These, these kind of factors have intersected with the availability of new toys. Um, the, the next generation of DNA sequences has enabled um, genome biology, the collection of massive RNA and DNA sequence data sets for not much money, for very, well, in comparative terms, for very small budgets. So not small in dollar value, but now I think it's, it's fair to say that Genome biology is in the hands of consortia of, of uh, research groups or in even individual research laboratories, whereas previously this has really been the undertaking of central sequencing facilities. I'm fortunate enough to have been involved in coral genomics since near the beginning, um, having worked on this particular coral for something like 20 years. And um, it's interesting to see how the science has grown from from cloning the first coral genes, isolating DNA and cloning the first coral genes some 20 years ago, to now the, the, um, the era of whole genome sequences. The first three of these phases really um, are poor man's genomics kinds of approaches. So these are really sequencing genes, sequencing expressed genes as a way of quickly getting information um, most of the information that we need, most of the information we're interested in, is carried in the, the expressed sequences, the, the, the messenger RNAs. And sequencing these is very cost effective. So the poor man's genome project is really the, the transcriptomics project, has really been, until a year or so ago, um, what we focused on. Um, the advantage of this, this kind of approach is that you're not sequencing junk, you're not sequencing non functional on coding DNA, um, but the disadvantage is that ultimately you want to know about that junk because it's not completely non-functional. It does carry useful information. And these sort of single gene approaches um, that we've taken over the last 15 years or so have, have really, um, they've advanced significantly coral biology. They've given us candidate genes for roles in specific processes such as calcification. You're looking here at uh, the expression pattern on the uh, left, the expression pattern of uh, a gene um, we think associated with calcification because it's in the right place at the right time for a role in calcification. But now we're at the, well, we were uh, 
at the phase of, of whole transcriptome analysis, this has really been enabled by the availability of high throughput sequences. So, whereas previously we've been cloning single genes and, and um, groups of genes, now with the availability of next-gen sequences, we're able to, we were able to think about sequencing pretty much every gene. Um, so, you know, in my naive um, mind, I, I imagine this would be a fairly simple exercise where we simply took um, various stages of coral development, um, extracted messenger RNA from these, we made complementary DNA, and we fed this into a sequencer, a next-gen sequencer. We collected our massive amounts of data, and we threw it at a computer to assemble. However, it's really not that simple, um, as Sylvain Faure, a very bright young bioinformatician with us in the Coral Center, uh, pointed out to me um, that assembling a transcriptome is, is actually a very complex undertaking, um, largely because what you're dealing with um, are multiple versions of the same primary transcript. So RNA, unlike DNA, RNA is spliced in alternate ways. Most um, genes um, produce multiple messenger RNAs. And assembling all of this from scratch, particularly from short read data, is very, very challenging. So thanks largely to Sylvan's efforts, um, we've assembled, we've co accumulated a large volume of data. Um, thanks to Sylvan, it's been assembled um, in optimal ways. The, the transcriptome is, is far from perfect, but um, we can use it as a reference, and we've been using it as a reference for comparing gene expression levels. So what we're able to do here is, is to take a biological process like settlement and metamorphosis and not just look at individual genes, we can theoretically look at how every gene in the genome changes at, at particular times in metamorphosis. So we've used this kind of approach to begin to dissect settlement and metamorphosis, immunity and disease, and also to begin to look at um, impacts of various climate change scenarios on the whole transcriptome, on every gene in the genome. So um, later today, Aurelie Moyer, a very talented young postdoc, will show you work which has been based on these reference transcriptomes, where she's looked at the impact on early life history stages of um, various elevated CO2 regimes. In brief, what she's found is many genes go down, but some also go up. But moving beyond the transcriptome, about a year or so ago, um, we were approached by the Australian Genome Research Facility um, about uh, the possibility of using our coral as a sort of test case, a proof of principle for genomics in Australia. There's not previously been a whole genome sequence, a complex whole genome sequence, determined and assembled in Australia. So we're fortunate enough to be the test case. Um, why, why is this of interest to us? Well, this should give us exact gene numbers. From the transcriptome data, it's very hard to determine exact numbers of genes, and having exact numbers of genes will enable us to make quantitative or near-quantitative comparisons with, particularly in interestingly, the, the C. anemone nematostella. Um, C. anemones and corals are close, in inverted commas, relatives. Um, they're both anthozoan and cnidarians, but there's some really major biological differences. C. anemones are solitary um, and have no skeleton. Um, no, most of them have no symbionts. So if we can compare whole gene sets between Acropora and the C. anemone, the Manistella, hopefully we can get some ideas about what is required, what genes are required to enable these coral-specific traits. This is one of our big goals um, in determining the genome sequence. So theoretically, um, next-gen sequencing machines can deliver whole genome sequences at low costs, um, but it's not that simple. Um, the, the kind of proof of principle for assembling complex genomes from next-gen data was the um, giant panda genome sequence, 
which was determined by the Beijing Genomics Institute and published early this year. This is really a Herculean effort. <coughs> this is a very large genome, a, a two or three gigabase genome sequence. By comparison, the coral genome sequence is, is much smaller, is an order of magnitude smaller. And this was done using exclusively short read data. Really impressive piece of work. However, um, the institute that did this is, is the sequence factory. It, it has um, probably half the next-gen machines in Asia in, in one institution, and it has an army of bioinformaticians. Um, so our, our undertaking is modest by comparison. We're fortunate enough to have a, a team of bioinformaticians led by Sylvain Fauré scattered across Australia who are um, helping assemble the genome. But unfortunately, it's an ongoing, a sl relatively slow and ongoing process. I can show you where we're at with this. We have what would seem on paper quite a large volume of data. We have about 35 gigabases of Illumina data which in theory is over a hundredfold coverage, um, by which I mean we should have every base in the genome sequenced um, at least a hundred times on average. Um, since the, the genome is about 300 megabases, although the assembly is still fragmented, is still far from optimal, it, we can use it to estimate things like <coughs> gene number, estimate gene number. And when you do this, we come up with estimates of around 20,000, about the same number of genes as you and I have, interestingly. Comparing, doing preliminary comparisons with the C anemone, um, you can see that the, the, over half the coral genes have a clear match in the C anemone, nematostella. Um, something like 40% are unique that is, have no matches elsewhere. But there's a small proportion, maybe 5% of genes in Acropora which match something in another animal that's not there in the sea anemone, like gene loss. So sea anemones have lost some genes. If you do the reciprocal comparison, you also see that corals have lost some genes. The basic molecular toolkit, the, the set of transcription factors and signaling molecules, in coral turns out to be surprisingly vertebrate-like. It's very like that of you and I, um, as is that of the C. anemone nematostella. This is ancestral genetic complexity. Um, the most interesting thing I think that's come out of the preliminary comparison so far is that some specific gene families are quite expanded in coral relative to other animals. An example of this um, are a family of um, immune-related genes. So these genes with these domains, genes which encode proteins with these kinds of domains, CARD, NACHT, death domains and death effector domains, um, in general have roles in immunity, um, in vertebrates, um, oftentimes also in invertebrates. And if you look at Acropora, for example, with Nach domains, it's got three times as many of these as in the sea anemone or in vertebrates. These numbers for Acropora are, are approximate. They're, they're rubbery because of the state of the genome assembly, but they're not going to change threefold. They may change by five or ten, but they're not going to change thus much. We'd like to think, we, we assume, that many of these genes will turn out to have roles in immunity in corals, as in other animals. And, and this is an area of great interest to us. We also think that some of these proteins are likely to have roles in, in symbiosis, too. So unfortunately, we need more data. Um, I gather that more data are being determined right now. We need to do another round of assembly, which will keep the bioinformaticians busy for a few months. But I think it's fair to say that a lot of exciting biology lies ahead. The transcriptome is already yielding, the transcriptome assembly is already yielding some really interesting results, as orally will show you later. And I think the genome holds is, is going to be even more exciting for many of us.
And this is finally to remind me to say that um, corals are, of course, a very diverse group. Functionally a diverse group, phylogenetically a diverse group. So having a whole genome sequence for a cropper is only the beginning of genome biology for corals. Um, and I need to acknowledge some of the key players, uh, Sylvan um, Orly, um, but also uh, I need to give credit to the ANU group, Eldon Ball's group, and particularly Dave Hayward at ANU. Um, the, co the Coral Genome Project really is a collaboration between my lab and Eldon's lab.